Shall I say them again? Weed, grass, pot, indo, ganja, Mary Jane. Oh, any others? <laughs> well, I will tell you, um, there were over 100 names for marijuana. And, I, and in preparation for tonight's meeting, I decided to go to Central America, right, on a field trip. I actually was in Central America on Monday, and technically in Nicaragua, marijuana is illegal. But I will tell you from what I saw and what it seemed to be, if you had the right amount of cash, you were the right nationality, or the right skin color, people would just look the other way. So very interesting culture there. I also had a lot of time on the plane, and now there's Wi-Fi on the plane, and I had a lot of time in airports to do a bunch of research. And I did get to see the Sanjay Gupta special, which I would recommend everyone go and see if you haven't done so already. But I also got a few fun facts. Let's see if you guys have heard these ones. In 1619, the Virginia General Assembly passed legislation requiring every farmer to grow hemp. Hmm, interesting. In the 1900s, Mexican immigrants introduced recreational use of marijuana in the United States. In 1931, for various reasons, some reasons you'll hear about tonight, 29 states outlawed marijuana. In 1996, California legalized medical marijuana. And today, as of today, marijuana is legal in some way, shape, or form in 20 states and in the District of Columbia. So the question we have on the table today, is it good or bad to legalize marijuana? And really, who does it impact? We are privileged this evening to have Ed McMahon from Normal, Debbie Taylor from the Phoenix House, and Kate McCauley from Ready to help us answer these questions and really to have a broader discussion. So first up, we have Ed McMahon. He is the director of Normal, which is the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws. He ran two dispensaries in Los Angeles. I bet you have some good stories about that. And he is a linguist by background and works as a software engineer. Please welcome Ed. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight and for inviting Virginia Normal to be a part of your program. We really appreciate it. Um, I think this signifies that the cannabis movement in Virginia is making progress and that we actually represent mainstream public opinion on the issue. Um, before we start, let's see a show of hands. Who supports? legalization. Come on. Don't be shy. It's the majority of people. I don't know. Fair enough. That's why you're here. Excellent. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to talk tonight about three main things. First, why is cannabis prohibition bad? Why is legalizing cannabis good for Virginia? And then address some of the common fears that people have about a legal cannabis market. The criminalization of cannabis since 1937 has, has been a disaster. In a nutshell, it costs an enormous amount, it doesn't achieve its goals, and it leaves our citizens worse off. It's expensive, in the, to the tune of $65 million to $125 million a year, at least in Virginia. Uh, that's spent to arrest, prosecute, incarcerate, and supervise marijuana offenders. About 90% of those are for possession only. Sellers and growers routinely receive multi-year prison sentences, while in other states, they are now earning an honest living and contributing to taxes. But according to our Virginia lawmakers, the money and manpower committed to controlling marijuana use greatly exceeds its social costs or potential for individual harm. Next. It's ineffective. It doesn't achieve its goals. It, cannabis prohibition has never worked to reduce or eliminate the use of cannabis. Cannabis has been used in virtually every culture for at least 5,000 years. And it was probably, very possibly, the first domesticated plant. We have very little to show for the money and resources we've thrown into this prohibition. The law and all those millions of dollars have never and will never prevent anyone from using growing or selling cannabis. 
Our own Virginia General Assembly has even said, law enforcement efforts have not had a significant impact on the availability or use of marijuana. This month, at least 350,000 Virginians will use cannabis, but they won't pay taxes and they won't consume a regulated product. Other countries with less punitive laws see lower rates of drug use than the U.S. As you can see, the U.S. has higher rates of both marijuana and other drug use than countries with less harsh laws. I'll point out the Netherlands has de facto legal cannabis for adults, has a much lower rate. And Portugal decriminalized all drugs and has a much lower rate use rate. Uh, they've seen great success in lowering their heroin use rate, for example. And finally, Cannabis prohibition is bad for our citizens in many, many ways. It diverts police time and resources from policing and prosecuting real crimes, such as drunk drivers, rapes, child abuse, and child predators. While a cop is wasting time writing a ticket or arresting a user, a drunk driver is not caught cruising down our highway, and a burglar is left free to invade a home. It gives otherwise law-abiding citizens a criminal record, which causes all sorts of problems that haunt them for years and years. It allows and encourages criminal gangs to control the market with the consequences we've seen in Mexico's bloody cartel wars. And finally, it prevents our citizens from using a safe, proven medicine that's been used for thousands of years to treat a huge number of conditions. So that's, in a nutshell, why some of, some of the few, there are many reasons why cannabis prohibition is bad. But now let's talk about why it is good. Why would it be good for Virginia to enact a legal cannabis market as exists and is flourishing in, in Colorado, as most of you probably understand? Several of the reasons. Reduced teen access. Better education of risks. Reduced harms from alcohol giving it our adults a safer option than the legal substances, alcohol and tobacco. Increased jobs and economic activity and increased tax revenue. Let's go through these quickly. Reduced teen access. So we understand the need to restrict access to, of cannabis to, to kids. But prohibition does a terrible job at it. Legal cannabis will be age restricted. You have to be 21 to buy or, or use cannabis and sellers will be required to check ID. Currently, teens are not carded when they buy cannabis, which is often from their peers. <clears throat> but states with adult access to legal medical cannabis actually see adolescent use rates steady or declining. Next, education of risks. A legal cannabis market will allow us to better educate citizens on the real risks of cannabis, because there are and we recognize those. Information about risks of dependence, risks of driving, risks to adolescents and to those, <coughs> excuse me, with a history or predisposition to mental illness would be available, would be provided at the point of sale. But these cannot happen while cannabis prohibition continues. Education and regulation is how we've managed to reduce tobacco use instead of criminalizing those possessing a single cigarette. As you can see, legal alcohol and tobacco use have dropped significantly for teenagers, while marijuana use has gone up and down, but is now higher than tobacco, which is regulated and which is illegal. Next, reduced alcohol harm. In states with legal medical cannabis, traffic fatalities have been reduced, as well as suicides, especially in young males. Research suggests it might be a substitute for alcohol, and if it is, we will see a reduction in alcohol-related harms. It will give our adults a safer option than the legal substances, alcohol and tobacco. Alcohol, cannabis is much safer than either one. Alcohol, we all know, can kill in one evening from an overdose, a domestic fight, or a drunk driving death. We accept that it's legal and it's sold to adults, even at baseball games where kids are everywhere. Tobacco kills over a lifetime, both the direct user and those who suffer from secondhand smoke. But we accept that it is legal and available only to adults. We accept that these can be used responsibly. 
making cannabis legal isn't adding a vice because it's already so prevalent, but it's giving adults a safer option because cannabis is much more benign to the user and to society. Dr. Besser is a pediatrician and father of two teenage, two teenage boys. He went into looking at cannabis legalization with the idea that, of course, it should be illegal. But once he looked at the arguments and looked at the medical evidence, he found and changed his mind, like Sanjay Gupta. But he changed his mind on legal recreational marijuana as well because he knows it is a safer option than either alcohol or tobacco, which we accept can be used responsibly. And it's irrational to allow people to use alcohol, which can be deadly, and not use cannabis, which cannot. Economically, big benefits. We can see increased tax revenue. In the 100 to $200 million range every year, we could certainly use those funds to help educate our youth and for prevention and treatment. Right now, cannabis is used and we get no funds from it. Colorado estimates $100 million in fresh taxes this year alone. And keep in mind that cannabis users are the only ones asking to pay more in taxes. <laughs> and finally, it will increase jobs and economic activity. Colorado reports that it will have a cannabis legal recreational market of $600 million this year alone with a smaller population. Jobs will be created in many different industries beyond growing and selling. It will have a ripple effect on the economy. Finally, I want to address some fears. Some common fears about legalizing marijuana. And that's driving, the gateway effect, potency, and message to kids. Driving. Cannabis can impair driving, and normal supports efforts to reduce that. However, it doesn't impair driving nearly to the extent that alcohol does, and to the extent that people use cannabis instead of alcohol, driving deaths will fall, as they have in states with legal medical cannabis. So-called gateway effect. This has been debunked years ago. As our Virginia legislator said in 1979, there is no evidence to suggest that marijuana use necessarily leads to the use of other drugs. And although people who use stronger drugs usually have previously used cannabis, that doesn't mean that cannabis caused them to seek other drugs. Alcohol use is the better predictor of future drug use. Cannabis can actually be considered a terminus drug because most of the people who try it don't use it regularly, and those who do rarely use anything else. Potency. Cannabis has always been available in various potencies from Afghani hash to Jamaican ganja to West Coast wax. The stronger the cannabis, the less someone uses, similar to beer and liquor. Stronger cannabis is not more dangerous because cannabis in any strength is not fatal. Legal, synthetic, prescribed, Marinol is 100% THC. And finally, the message to kids. This is one of the important ones that people always harp about. Message to kids. What are we saying if we make this legal? Our message to kids is do not use cannabis. It is an adult activity. It is, our message is clear and unambiguous. Just because something is legal for adults does not mean that children should do it. It can affect the adolescent brain, and kids should be doing homework and playing sports and playing music. It's the same message that we give for alcohol, tobacco, and sex. Wait until you're an adult. So in conclusion, a legal market will be beneficial to Virginians in a variety of ways, not only for those who use cannabis, but for everyone. Just like alcohol prohibition, cannabis prohibition is a failed experiment, and we must move cannabis from the street corner to the sales counter from the black market to the taxed market. Thank you. All right, let's give Ed another round of applause. Thank you, Ed. All right, next up we have Debbie Taylor. Debbie is the Senior Vice President and Regional Director of the Phoenix House. She has over 40 years experience in healthcare and addiction treatment. She was trained as a psychiatric nurse and certified in chemical dependency. And also Debbie is a former Committee of 100 board member. Please welcome Debbie Taylor. Can I put this somewhere? Once. Thank you so much. Uh, as Kim said, I am Debbie Taylor. I am the Senior VP and Regional Director for Phoenix House. Previously Vanguard Services, 
which is an Arlington-founded not-for-profit which has offered services to individuals suffering from substance abuse treatment for the last 52 years. I'm a psychiatric nurse by training with a specialty in chemical dependency, and I've worked in this field with individuals and families who are suffering the effects of use of alcohol and drugs since 1972. That's over 40 years. That's a lot of families and a lot of individuals. And I must say I've been touched by all of them. I entered the field as a child of the 70s, those of you who remember, uh, thinking we could end this problem with drugs as kids and adults just needed to learn about the dangers of overuse so they could control their use and therefore the negative consequences. How naive I was. I'm here tonight to present a counterpoint, a different way of looking at legalization of marijuana than what you have heard from, from the normal folks. This was one of the more difficult topics that I've been asked to speak about because it's not simple. My simple answer when I'm asked about this, which I am constantly, is if marijuana is legalized, my business will boom. And my question back to the asker is, is that a good thing? Is that what we want? I believe that you would want more than that simple answer, so I started the research process, which I suggest you all do for yourselves, because this is a very important issue. National Institute of Drug Abuse, National Institute of Health, the UN, and the, and the media, and the, the internet is full of interesting studies that you can look at and decide from your own perspective. But I'll briefly review the highlights that I found. First of all, there are health effects. Marijuana affects the brain by activating the reward center of the brain in the same way nearly all drugs of abuse do, by stimulating the brain cells to release chemical dopamine, that which allows us to feel pleasure. It feels good, so we do it. And we f it feels good again, so we do it again. Marijuana use impairs a person's ability to form new memories and to shift focus. It disrupts coordination, balance, and reaction time. Therefore, learning, doing complicated tasks, participating in athletics, and driving are also affected when under the influence. Marijuana users who have taken large doses of the drug may experience acute psychosis, which includes hallucinations, delusions, a loss of the sense of personal identity. Short-term psychotic reactions to high concentrations of THC are distinct from longer-acting schizophrenic-like disorders that have been associated with the use of marijuana. Marijuana impairs short-term memory, attention, judgment, and sleep. Marijuana can lead to addiction, not for everybody. It is estimated that 9% of people who use marijuana will become dependent on it. The number goes to about one in six in those who start using young and in their teens, and to 25 to 50 percent among daily users. A study of over 300 fraternal and identical twins found that the twin who had used marijuana before the age of 17 had elevated rates of other drug use and drug problems later on compared with the twin who did not use it before the age of 17. Marijuana use increases the risk of, the risk of schizophrenia in vulnerable individuals. Research in the past decade shows a link between marijuana use and psychosis. The amount of drug used, the age at first use, and genetic vulnerability obviously influence that relationship. Research has shown that marijuana's negative effect on attention, memory, and learning can last for days or weeks. A major analysis of 48 relevant studies found cannabis use to be associated consistently with reduced educational attainment, grades, and chances of graduating. Driving safety will also be affected. 8.6 of weekend nighttime drivers tested positive for marijuana. 26.9 of seriously injured drivers admitted to a level one shock trauma were positive for marijuana. That's over one quarter. In Washington state, 12.7 of fatally injured drivers tested positive for marijuana. Economically, it also has issues too. The greatest costs of marijuana are not related to the prohibition, but with the use itself. Marijuana is currently the leading cause of substance dependence other than alcohol in the United States, 
Roughly two-thirds of Americans suffering from dependence are suffering from marijuana abuse or dependence. In 2010, alcohol-related costs were over $185 billion, with only 14.5 in tax revenue, 12 times greater. Tobacco use costs over $200 billion, with only $25 billion collected on taxes, eight times greater. The legalization of gambling has not reduced illegal gambling. It's increased. Illegal marijuana trafficking would thrive by selling more potent products outside legal channels without tax or age restriction. In 2010, there were 15.2 million current marijuana users compared to 129 million alcohol users and 70.9 tobacco users. If marijuana were legalized, the increase in users would be both large and rapid with subsequent increases in addiction and costs for public safety, health care, treatment, and criminal justice. So I want to end my remarks with a statement and a few questions for you to think about. My statement, the future of drug policy in this state or in this country should not be a choice between using the criminal justice system or treatment. The goal needs to be to get those two systems to work together to both improve public safety and public health. My questions is based on what you have heard tonight and other things that you have heard from, from stories and your own research. Is legalizing marijuana going to make this a worse country or a better one? What is the value that marijuana brings? Would you want to live in a neighborhood filled with people who regularly smoke marijuana? Would you want your kids or grandkids regularly smoking marijuana? Now is the time to think about this seriously because it's easy to legalize marijuana. Yet when things go predictably wrong down the road, it will be a lot harder to put the genie back in the bottle. It's bad enough that we lose so many Americans to cigarettes and alcohol-related injuries, crimes, alcoholism, and drunk driving. Do we really want to endorse the loss of millions more potentially healthy, productive Americans via marijuana? I have to say, no, I don't. Thank you. Wow, definitely food for thought. And now we have our final speaker, uh, Kate McCauley, is the project coordinator at Ready, which is reduce or eliminate alcohol and drug use by youths. She's also the principal founder at Key Concepts and an adjunct faculty member at Marymount University, and I also believe George Mason as well. Please give a warm welcome to Kate. Thank you, Kim. I'm a little nervous. So many important Arlington people here. So I'm going to try and watch my time and make sure that I say the things that are going to be useful. I have the advantage of not discussing the pro or the con on this. What I was invited to do was to come in and talk about talking to the children we love about alcohol, or uh, I'm sorry, about marijuana and what the concerns are. I really appreciate that Normal speaks out and says that they believe that underage um, folks should not be using marijuana and that they support that in the ways that they do. Um, what I do want to do is disabuse one of the facts that Mr. McCann shared, and that is that in every state where, in fact, they have um, um, legalized medical marijuana, we have seen increases of marijuana use by kids who are underage. And in fact, um, in Colorado, before recreational marijuana was legalized, what they were finding was that kids were showing up in school with marijuana still in their dispensary packages. So um, I don't want us to think that, that, in fact, there are ways in which when we make this legal, it makes it so that we can protect our teens better. Alcohol is a good example of that. Alcohol, in fact, is the um, uh, drug of choice for teenagers right now. It's the drug of choice for teenagers right now because it's legal and it's accessible. Um, what we have seen, though, and what is really um, concerning 
and I actually need to go back to my notes. Sorry. I want to talk real quickly about um, why it is that we need to be talking to the children we love about this. Most importantly, it has to do with the teen brain and teen brain development. Up until about 20 years ago, we thought that the teen brain was just an immature adult brain and that all it needed to do was to get some experiences and the more experiences it would get, the better it would get and they would do the right thing, right? What we've discovered now that we have all this wonderful functional magnetic resonance imaging is um, that, in fact, the brain is still developing a ton of connectivity. It's also doing a lot of pruning of areas that it hasn't used in the past. And Francis Jensen talks about the fact that currently, for te in teenage brains, that what we see is this neuron, neuron plasticity, where the brain is learning how, in fact, to react and respond to things that are happening. Um, one of the, well, two things that happen then for the adolescent brain um, have to do with development. One is that as the brain is pruning, it is also craving um, novel experiences. And so what we see is that teenagers are now going out and trying things that they never tried before. I remember I had a friend who was so upset because her daughter was finally trying Brie after she tried to get her to eat brie all through like 9, 10, 11, and 12, suddenly she's out with her friends and she's eating brie. And, um, but that's part of what the teenage brain is doing. And in part, what it's designed to do in order to do that is to help them move away. If their brain didn't do this, they'd live with us till they're 30. And while some of us would like that to still happen, some of us want to move them along. The risk with this neuron plasticity, however, is that when substances are introduced um, to the brain in its developing period, one of the things that it looks like happens is that, in fact, the brain learns to be addicted. We know this for alcohol, it looks like it for um, marijuana and for other drugs as well. So that when a developing brain's brain gets introduced to these substances, what it learns to do is to prefer them and to look for them and to habituate them in such a way that, they can't, that teens can't feel normal without having the substances in their brain. And that part of what the research is telling us, in fact, is that when the younger the age, and, and Debbie sort of said some of this, but what I want to say is that all of those things that Debbie was talking about just quadruple it when we're talking about teenagers. So that the earlier that teens introduce marijuana into their brains, the more likely it is that they're going to have experience with, um, with um, substance abuse and dependence and addiction. And so it's really, really important that what we're doing is doing the things that our kids need us to do, the children that we love need us to do, to help them to not use alcohol, marijuana, any of the other drugs. Um, peer pressure is really important. I say this to parents all the time. Peer pressure is so important. Again, it's what helps them move out and keeps them from staying with us until they're 30. However, one of the things that I think a lot of adults believe is that peer pressure is more powerful than the influence of loving adults, and that is just not the case. Consistently in the research, we see that children who have adults in their lives who are giving clear and unambiguous messages about substance use and about other risky behaviors, for the most part, are making choices not to engage in those behaviors. We have those few outliers, those risky kids that are going to try stuff anyway. But in, in most cases, what we know is that kids who have clear and unambiguous messages, and that's not, don't do anything I wouldn't do. That's saying, we expect in our house, or we expect of our grandchildren, that you're not going to use alcohol, that you're not going to use marijuana, and that you're going to find ways, and you're going to let us help you find ways to not get engaged in that kind of behavior. Um, the other part about brain development that I wanted to mention is that the last part of our brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex. That's the part up front here. I know all the scientists out there know that. For those of you who haven't read the millions of articles that have been in Time and Newsweek and everything else out there, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that does judgment and decision making. It's the last part to develop. The American Academy of Pediatrics now identifies that they accept patients up until the age of 25 because the um, human body is still developing in that pediatric and adolescent way up until the age of 25, particularly the prefrontal cortex. So one of the things that we see is that those kids who are, have the developing brain with the neuron plasticity also have limited judgment. 
It's why they make the poor decisions that they often make as a part of being stimulated for novel experiences, blah, 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 blah. And when we say to them, why did you do that? They will make up something, but they really don't know why. And it's because their brain is still developing, which is not a good enough excuse, let me just say. As a mother of two teenagers, my brain is still developing is not the reason that you get away with things. <laughs> The other thing that I want to mention is that the psychological process for, um, for teenagers in development has to do with both wanting to stand out and fit in. And so there's a lot of pressure that our teenagers experience when they're exposed to opportunities to take risky behaviors. There's a lot of conversation about the difference between hot and cold cognition. I'm going to run out of time. I know this. Um, between hot and cold cognition. Cold cognition is so when you say, so if somebody offers you a drink, sweetheart, what is it that you're going to say? And the child says, I'm going to say no, thank you. And the child absolutely believes that that's the case until somebody comes up and says, hey, you want a drink? Now it becomes hot cognition, and it's so much harder, and they can't anticipate it until they're in the experience. So um, I, I do want to talk about what um, the changes in the country around medical marijuana and legalization have meant in terms of Arlington. What we've seen in the last three years um, in our data, and uh, I think many of you know the Arlington Partnership for Children, Youth, and Family collects data um, from our uh, 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. What we've seen is some really concerning trends where we were seeing really a flat line in terms of marijuana use. We're now seeing an increase in marijuana use over the last three years. Where we were seeing um, perceptions of harm remaining relatively um, stable in the last three years, we've seen them crash. Perceptions of harm have to do with whether or not teenagers think that marijuana is dangerous. What I'm hearing anecdotally from parents is that their kids, when they get caught using weed, are saying, well, at least I'm not drinking alcohol. So we've done this really good job of helping kids understand the risks associated with alcohol. What doesn't happen is th their understanding of the risks associated with marijuana. The other thing is that we're seeing a moderate decrease in children's perceptions of parental disapproval. As we're all struggling with where we stand on the um, legalization issue, as we all talk about not wanting first-time users to go to jail, which by the fact most, but let me just say, most first-time users don't go to jail. There we go, exactly. Um, we, um, our kids are hearing our own ambivalence, and they're not hearing us say, our expectation is that you're not drinking, you're not using, and you're not taking risks. So what I want to do real quickly is just talk about how many minutes do I have left? One. Start and keep the conversation going. Um, these conversations seem hard the first time. Once you have them, once you have your first conversation, actually what kids tell us is that it increases the trust levels. It doesn't decrease them. Kids want to hear this. My husband and I were talking about me coming tonight to my 16-year-old last night. We said, what is it that you think is important to say? And there were two things that, that he said, and I'm going to out my husband on this. My husband, who did um, have experiences with marijuana when he was in college, one of the things that our son said is, you know, Dad, when you talk about how you regret what you did and the fact that you feel a little embarrassed when you talk about it, that talks to me about why it is that I don't want to use marijuana. And the other thing that he said, and we have a green handout, I'll, put it, I'll show you over there, that has answers to sort of all of the things that kids frequent, not all, but many of the things kids frequently say. The other thing that he said is that, Mom, when you say to me that um, when, how do I say this, when people say, um, I'm not planning on being a pothead, I just want to try it, my response has been, I've never met anyone who started out wanting to be a pothead. And yet we see people becoming potheads, and we can't predict who's going to be a pothead. And so, at least for my son, that has been a response that's been useful to him. Um, remain calm. Make sure that you're comfortable having the conversation. Do it without judgment. Be willing to talk and to listen. There are lots of ways to start this conversation. The best way is to talk not about what are you doing, but what is it that kids these days are doing and to hear more about that and to listen and to then ask, what do you think about that? Um, the other thing is, and, and we know this through the, um, through the partnership and the developmental assets, it's really important for children to have another caring adult in their lives that they can talk to if they don't feel comfortable talking to us. So hopefully some of you are those caring adults 
in other people's children's lives, and you know how to do that. The last thing that I would just share is um, a quote that I've sort of um, played with a little bit that came out of Time Magazine. If you're tempted to drink alcohol or smoke pot, please let's talk about it. I want you to hold off while your beautiful brain is still developing. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kate. Now we come to uh, our favorite part of the evening. I'm going to ask our panelists to come on up to the stage. And while they're getting situated, oh, sorry. Come on up. And while they're getting situated, I have a few dates for you to put on your calendars. For those of you who have electronic calendars, or Ed Nolan, who has a brown berry, Ed, hold up that brown berry. <laughs> April 9th, it's a Wednesday. Police, behind the scenes. Yes, there are undercover agents in Arlington. Come find out about them on April 9th. June 18th is our 60th birthday party. Yay! It is going to be at Washington Golf and Country Club, so please put that on your calendar. Yes, you have to dress up. And without further ado, uh, this is our favorite part of the evening. Let's see, who has mics tonight? John and Lynn, please, uh, if you could stand up and say your name and ask your question. And please make sure it's in the form of a question. Who do we have first? I think Marie in the front. Um, I have a question, uh, Marie Shum Brady. Uh, what else did you want me to say? I guess. And my question is, is in the literature and in the research from all the way back when we were teenagers, how many teenagers try alcohol or illicit drugs and walk away without an addiction? If we want to get this in perspective, we got to look at how many people try it and walk away. How many people try it and are hooked because they were going to get hooked on something anyway because they have an addictive personality. Um, the research that I cited that comes from the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Health will tell you that a teenager, one out of six, um, will develop a, a dependence on, on a substance. So f five of the people would not. So it's one out of six. One out of nine if they start later in life and 25 to 50% if they're using daily. So it, it becomes, you know, with the amount, it becomes much greater with, with marijuana. I just wanted to sort of echo uh, the part that Debbie said about the importance of delaying um, use because what we see is that um, kids who start using alcohol, marijuana, any of the substances, before the age of 16 have a 75% higher chance of developing an addiction later in life than those who postpone until age 21. Um, okay. Uh, more people become addicted far more to uh, tobacco and alcohol in, in a percentage-wise than do to marijuana. Uh, I, I think that if, if the rate is 9% develop a, a dependence on marijuana, then the rate is 15% of, of alcohol and probably 29 to 30 percent for tobacco so I think uh, I'm s I might ask my colleagues if that's approximately right <laughs> basically marijuana is less addictive than the currently legal substances is, is the answer okay we have a question in the middle um, Dottie I believe hold on wait for a mic for me for a second Dottie Clark, and I have to I have to kind of tell you who I am. I'm a judge in Arlington, which is why I said nobody's arrested. I mean, nobody. Well, for, let's start with nobody's arrested for possession of marijuana. They they're served with a summons and given a court date. And that's how I know also that people do not go to jail on first time marijuana offenses in Virginia. But my question really most do not, but some do, and I have the statistics that we can share. Well, from I'd the like Supreme Court of Virginia. I'd like you to tell me the last person who went to jail on a first-time marijuana conviction in Arlington County. I'd like you to tell me. Because I've been, I've been a judge for a long time. It has never happened not as long as I've been a judge. Now, I wanted to ask you a question, though, which is 
why if I mean I, I hear your statistic about marijuana being less addictive than alcohol and tobacco we in this country have a huge problem with addictions to alcohol tobacco and yeah. marijuana I mean I'm and, and other drugs I'm the you know we do why would we want to legalize yet another thing that we're having trouble I mean when we when we really can't get in front of a alcohol and tobacco addictions what would be the value in throwing something else into that mix well you know as I said it's an enormous cost that doesn't doesn't work to achieve what you're trying to achieve the, the prohibition doesn't actually do what you want to do that's the problem it doesn't achieve what you want to achieve which is reducing use and and if we look at other countries and if we look at many states that have liberalized laws and there are many studies to back this up that in fact loosening these laws will do better to achieve what we all want to achieve which is a lower rate of use especially among children um, and it, but it costs an enormous amount to try to do this I'm sorry I didn't mean sorry. to interrupt you that was impolite of me I apologize um, I think that during Prohibition, when Prohibition went through, um, the use of alcohol skyrocketed and has continued to skyrocket when it became legal. Um, I think that we are dealing with human beings who, if there is access and if there is minimal or no penalties, um, they will continue to use it if it creates a pleasurable feeling. Um, I, when I, you know, I'm old enough to remember with DUIs, um, Judge Clark, when I remember when I first was in treatment, working in the treatment field, I would have people who had nine DUIs, and they're in treatment, and I would sort of go, well, how can you have nine DUIs? And it wasn't until we put teeth in it where we said, okay, automatic, y if you, if you, you don't go to jail necessarily, but if you drive when you're drunk, you're going to lose your license. Um, then we started seeing a change in, in the behavior. I don't see people coming into treatment anymore that have nine DUIs. I see them in treatment on their first DUI. Um, and in their second DUI, they, they're, they're doing weekends uh, in, a, in, a, in something. So there's some teeth. There's some smart, consistent penalties. Um, because I think that access equals use increase and that's the problem and that's the dilemma that we as a as a country and as a community have have to deal with so th one of the things that i'd like to say because as as i've been working in the prevention field for about 15 or 20 years not the treatment field but doing the prevention work when what i hear is people who are interested in legalizing marijuana or decriminalizing marijuana which feels very euphemistic to me, when they say it's safer than um, alcohol and tobacco, that is a very low bar. You know, to say that it's safer than those two things is not a very high bar to be jumping over to suggest that it's something that we should make readily available to anybody who wants it and perhaps restrict it. Um, alcohol and tobacco were both legalized before we had the science to explain what was going on, what the risks and dangers were associated with it. And as we've seen the science develop, part of what we've seen is more and more restrictive laws and policies related to it. And so what we see now is you can't smoke in an office. You, uh, in fact, in Virginia now, whoever thought we were going to get to the point where you couldn't have tobacco in restaurants? But in fact, we've gotten there because we know what the risks are. Um, this similarly with alcohol, for a long time there wasn't a focus on drinking and driving. Now we have a much stronger focus on drinking and driving. So when we're looking at something where we have science that suggests that this is not good for you, it doesn't make sense to me that we would actually be saying, well, just because it's not, at, it's not going to kill you like alcohol and tobacco might, that we should make it legal, doesn't feel like a really strong argument to me. All right, I want to go to this side of the room. I think Joan, who was up? Joan, then Max. I'm Joan Quinn. You've made a very strong statement for non-use of marijuana. I'm wondering what the arguments are for use other than economic, and I'm coming from cancer and pain relief and medical use. I, I guess I'll begin. Um, if you're referring to medical use, uh, cannabis has a, 
immense number of medical properties and can help an immense number of conditions. And I find that more and more as I, as I talk to people. And I mean, there have been countless people who've told me, you know, just anecdotally, you know, I take I was taking 15 to 20 medications. Now I start I've started to use cannabis and I've reduced that to two or three. Uh, whether that's multiple sclerosis, arthritis, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, it can be used. It, it can actually be have a preventive effect. It have a preventive effect on uh, after a concussion. Um, I mean, there are myriad uses, and it's because of your endocannabinoid system. We have natural marijuana-like chemicals in our bodies that that help us heal and and stimulate appetite and all kinds of things. And um, but that's just the medical reason. And uh, for cancer, of course, it can help mitigate. Uh, Nausea can help stimulate appetite, uh, and in fact, we're finding um, not only THC, the main ingredient, but CBD and uh, other cannabinoids can actually help shrink tumors. Um, and actually, you know, it, I, I can't say that it's curing cancer, but there are an awful lot of studies going on to see how it can be used to treat cancer primarily. Uh, there are other reasons why people use cannabis non medically. Uh, they may be for spiritual reasons, they may be for emotional, they may be for pure recreational, like someone has a martini. Um, they may be for social reasons, they may be because they have social anxiety and it helps them you know, relate to other people a little better. It may be to help them enjoy a movie, uh, frankly. Um, so there, there are many reasons why people have used cannabis for 5,000 years. So um, just a couple of remarks that I would make um, with regard to that as a twice cancer survivor myself. Um, one of the things is, is that the American Medical Association has not yet been able to wrap its, its own arms around um, the idea of medical marijuana. I think part of it is, is that in fact there haven't been enough studies to be able to look at it. Marinol is available um, and it is available by prescription which is, as Mr. McCann mentioned, um, full THC. I understand that not everyone can consume Marinol as a pill, um, but smoking it isn't necessarily the um, the way to bring it um, to bring it on. And now I've lost my second point. Did you want to say something else? Uh, that's right. Smoking is is probably not a preferred way to ingest cannabis. You can use it on your joints for arthritis as a topical, uh, for bee stings, all kinds of things, eczema, and. Um, and vaporization, of course, is the main, and eating, of course, is a very common way of using this medication. Um, uh, there are have been thousands and thousands, approximately 20,000 studies over the years. It's one of the most studied plants and medications on Earth. It is false to say we do not have enough medical science to determine if this is a medicine. And that's partly why 20 states, um, including some legislatures, have legalized medical cannabis, including Virginia, which has a medical cannabis statute saying you can use it for cancer and glaucoma. It's only by prescription, which is not allowed by the federal government. But if that were not, were not the case, we would have medical cannabis here in Virginia already by law. Um, I'm sorry. The other thing that I just meant to mention is that part of um, the medical marijuana, with the exception of Marinol, is that um, physicians have um, not had training and um, and there's not been enough distinction about dosage and how it is to ensure that the right amounts of THC are getting to patients in the way that it needs to get to them. Okay, I believe we have Max and then Ann and then Michael. Hi, I'm Max Scruggs. Um, it seems to me that the sense of, of what I hear tonight is the that there are a good many people in here who would support, the, who would advocate the use of the poison for their children, for their grandchildren. I cannot believe that all the bad things that are caused by these drugs to the body, to the brain, for example, alcohol destroys parts of the brain. Hey, Max, do you have yes. a question? Why in the... <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm just... Uh, I just can't believe there's so much support for such, so many bad things that, that happen to the body. Okay, I think, uh, Ann? I actually wasn't going to speak because I know this is going to be on TV. And I raised six children in Arlington, three boys and three girls, one of which was doing super until I got in a hole in college, and I sent the other five and my husband to go get him. Being a child of the 60s, which I was, this is the exact same conversation that they had back then and how much better marijuana was than alcohol. 
Now my mother who had a glass of wine maybe three times in her life is not one of those uh, conversations where it became addictive. My father on the other hand can't say that. To think that we're having this conversation again when I have lost a number of friends and two of which were my godsons to murder over marijuana. To say that being legal would have saved their lives, I, I, I can't believe that. I want to know how many people who started marijuana and low doses have just stuck with marijuana. That would be a good number to know. And those who have become alcohol, I used to smoke. And thank God they taught me that how bad it was, and I stopped 30 years ago. Some people do learn from being educated. But to think that we are asking Arlington to agree to another drug would be insane to me. So maybe the question on um, marijuana, whether or not people stick with marijuana or move on to something else? The answer is 90%. If we're looking at 9% as the rate that's at which addiction. that's addiction, yeah, that's is that right? That's not addiction. It's addiction. Or move on to other drugs. Yeah. I, I mean, it's the vast majority. It's, you know, it's, uh, honestly, I don't know the figure, and that's a figure I, I need to look up. Uh, you know, I don't know that legal cannabis would, would have saved your children, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to say that. I, I don't know. Um, you know, there, there probably always will be a black market, unfortunately. Um, the question is, I think, how can we reduce the harms that from the market that exists today? You know, I think people like to pretend that marijuana doesn't exist, and if we legalize it, suddenly it would pop up everywhere. But that's totally false. It's everywhere. I mean, you look in police, you know, state police reports and general assembly reports for decades, and it's it's prevalent everywhere, unfortunately. Um, and I and I certainly agree with that, the prevalence. Um, but I certainly know that there are many young people and adults who draw a line on what is legal and what is not legal. And just the fact that something is illegal prevents them from going into that arena. As evidenced by what we're seeing now with prescription drugs, we have the largest epidemic right now coming from prescription drugs leading into heroin, okay? That barrier of them being legal is, is, a, is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, that if it's in my mom's medicine cabinet or if my friend is taking it or if it is prescribed for me, then it's okay and more is better. We're seeing that line crossed from prescription drugs into heroin and it's destroying the, urb the suburban Caucasian child. We have a, a, a larger epidemic now with those chemicals than we did of the combined problem with heroin and cocaine in the past 40 years. When you have, when you allow something to be legal, it breaks down the barriers. As Kate was saying earlier, that the studies do show that when the apparent risk is minimized, use will skyrocket. Um, and that's my fear. And what if I'm right? Um, you know, that's what scares me to death. Yes, my business will boom, but how many kids' lives will be affected and how many people's lives who will be affected? Maybe it's one in six, but that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of people whose lives might have been okay and might have been alive today um, if, if we didn't have that, that there. So I think that that's what causes me just tremendous cause to, to really consider what are we actually doing as a society with this issue. Uh, I would add that we've managed, thankfully, to reduce tobacco use in this country. And we didn't put tobacco dealers into prisons, and we haven't criminalized people who use tobacco. Instead, we've used education and restrictions, as we've said. No smoking in restaurants. We're not advocating smoking marijuana in restaurants. Okay, That's not the question. But it's the question of what is the better way to reduce that problematic use. And we've seen success with tobacco in a non-punitive, non-criminal way without spending 
billions of dollars. In fact, we made the tobacco companies spend a lot of billions of dollars to do it. After. Well, only through lawsuits. Yeah. True, and true. Kicking what, and screaming, true. And, and what I will also say is that, again, that continues to be a low bar when we talk about tobacco. But CVS has just recently come out and said that they will no longer be selling tobacco because of the risks that are associated with it. And so um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the black market when people can't walk into a CVS and easily um, or cheaply access their tobacco. Um, again, I don't think that that's a strong argument for why it is that we should um, make it available um, to the general population without some, um, some regulation attached to it. All right, we have time for one more question. I believe it was Michael. My name is Mike Wiener. Both a personal and perhaps semi-legal question. Uh, we know that alcohol uh, can be measured in the bloodstream fairly accurately, even though the, the effects may be less than, you, than what you can measure. And uh, the cabinet, uh, marijuana, the THC, is a fat-soluble substance, which can last in the system for several weeks or more, depending on the person. Uh, how comfortable should I be, or any of us be, uh, when our, you know, before the surgeon starts to operate, what would be the good level for him to have in his system? <laughs> or the pilot, before he takes off on the plane, or the school bus driver, and should there be an accident or a mishap uh, on the operating table, <laughs> what might be the legal ramifications of having this substance uh, in your body? That's a, that's a great point and one that's going to be very, very difficult because you are absolutely right. If you are a, a ca very casual user and use a small amount of marijuana, it can be out of your system in two, two days. I had a child when I worked at Virginia Hospital Center and, the and it was positive for marijuana for six months. Okay, It went down every time. I'd never seen anything like it and we tried to it. It went down. It was, it was there for six months. Um, now, was he under the influence for six months? I don't know. Was it in his system? Yeah. Um, and then it, he went negative, and then when he got sick with a high fever, he had a lot of excess fat. He got positive again. Do you know? So it's a it is insidious in that respect. And the public the public safety issues um, are are enormous on exactly that. Um, and I think in D.C. they're talking about that they sh you shouldn't be allowed to even test. And I'm like, wow. Do you know? I mean because you're t you, you could be dealing with somebody who is seriously impaired. I think in uh, Colorado and Washington both have a five nanogram per milliliter blood level limit. Um, uh, but as pointed out, levels can vary. An experienced user may have 20 times, 10 times that level and not have consumed that day and, and not, not be measurably impaired as, as measured by a driving test. Um, so, so it's difficult to say. Um, I do recall as a kind of an anecdote, um, I think it was CNN um, did a, just after the legalization vote, or after the New Year or something, in Washington State, did a, a driving test. And uh, the person who did the best was the ex most experienced, most chronic marijuana user who drove after smoking quite a bit of marijuana. I was even surprised. And the, and the cop who ro rode along with her said, no, I probably wouldn't have pulled her over. Um, that's not to say that we should drive under the influence of cannabis. Absolutely not. Uh, to the effect, to the extent that we can have a measurable limit, uh, normal would support that. To the extent that it's a unreasonable limit, we would not. To where drivers aren't impaired but still have something in their system. Uh, but we do not want people driving while they are impaired. Absolutely not. Or or any surgeons, airport, you know, anything. <laughs> but that's not stopping people now. So watch out for your, you know, during your knee replacement or whatever. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. NIDA and NIH are recommending one nanogram per, per milliliter. Yeah, so um, to, to suggest that there is no impairment. So five is five times that. Well, a lot of food for thought and not necessarily brownies tonight, right? <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank our speakers. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Kate. This has been a great program.